Dear brothers and sisters, I warmly welcome you in the strong name of Jesus Christ, and I trust your experience thus far has been very enriching. I want to thank the leadership here of uh, Asia Missions Association, the founding uh, president, all the volunteers from the Philippines who have made this conference possible. I also want to greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ from my home church in Singapore. I believe many of you have been to my country, Singapore. Can I see by the show of hands how many of you have been to uh, the cleanest city in the world, Singapore? <laughs> now, as you know, we, they call us the fine city, F-I-N-E. It means that when you are caught littering, you get a fine. And uh, when you are caught uh, doing a pedestrian crossing, when it's not uh, the right place, you're given another fine. And when the plane touches down Singapore Changi Airport, there's an announcement. If you are found to be chewing gum, you get a fine. So welcome to the fine city. And uh, we also have another reputation uh, that we are the cleanest city in the world. But I'm often reminded in the scriptures, Jesus has said, he took a cup and he said, you need to be clean on the inside. So the biblical reminder teachings is very helpful. And so that's our aim today as we look at missions in a pluralistic society. So I want to thank the organizers for choosing this topic. I think it's a very meaningful topic because all of us live in a pluralistic society. You will find my notes on page 21 of your heavy folder. I trust uh, all of you got that big folder and it's a blessing to be uh, having all those treasures in that folder. In this pluralistic religious world, we ask a question. Is Jesus the only saviour? The pluralists will answer in the negative. So how are pastors, missionaries and church leaders responding to this question? and great challenge. When we think of uh, the next slide, globalization, it brings with it many challenges, including climate changes, the uncertainty of employment, resulting in a sinking, sinking economy and a refugee crisis caused by regional conflicts. Very painfully, we see and hear reports in the media of the millions of refugees, especially women and children, searching for a home. So as leaders here at ANA, in the Missions of Christ, how are we experiencing such a phenomenon in our different contexts? Is the gospel penetrating into our present generation? So how should we approach missions in a pluralistic society? So as I thought about this uh, subject, I thought one way is to look at the biblical basis, and that should be our foundation as we think about missions in a pluralistic context. In a pluralistic society, there will be a variety of cultures, religions, and lifestyle. Pluralism is a political philosophy that recognizes diversity within a community or social environment. to existence of different interests. can be complicated have a strong faith in Christ Jesus. So one of the ways to recognize a pluralist is perhaps when you put your hands together, you can say a pluralist is one who believes that all religions will lead to God. So during the time of Christ, so characterized by plurality, worship was to be regarded as a God. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. In daily encounters, our Lord interacted with men and women in the community. The apostles were courageously proclaiming boldly the person and deity of Christ in a world of idols and cultic groups. The Lausanne Covenant, which many of us are very familiar, and perhaps we can say together, let's start. World evangelization, 
requires the whole church, let's say together, brothers and sisters, world evangelization requires the whole church to take the whole gospel to the whole world. Let's say the whole church, let's say together, the whole church to take the whole gospel to the whole world. So we are very familiar with that Lausanne uh, covenant. So every believer has a responsibility to share the good news to one's family, neighbor, colleague, and friend. What impact will the gospel have in a pluralistic society? Christians believe that the gospel has the ultimate truth and that all people everywhere need to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. God has revealed truth to us in the scriptures. The way for salvation for all people. And when we think of evangelism, we want to be faithful in proclaiming the gospel and depend on the will of God Almighty for the results. So we appeal, we plead for every believer to be reconciled to God. So let's now look at the scriptures. For example, in the Old Testament, if we turn to the slide on the biblical basis, I think you need to reverse all the way back to the Old Testament context. We're going to look at some of the examples that I have listed here. First one is Abraham who traveled and he too met people of different beliefs. The next one, uh, the next biblical character is uh, Moses and also followed by Joseph who lived in Egypt and God took them out of their comfort zone and put them there that they could interact with people of different beliefs, different cultures. And then we also see another biblical character and that is uh, Queen Esther. She lived in Asia. I've listed here in our notes and this is on page 23. You will see that I've used the example of Daniel. Daniel was remarkable, he and his friends. He was a faithful Jew. He had been taken captive and deported to Babylon. So to some extent, he was in a foreign land that was very hostile to God. But how did Daniel and his friends uh, exhibit themselves? They did not give in to pressures from an ungodly society because of their faith in God and a clear purpose in life. Now let's look at the New Testament. In the New Testament, the, in the next slide, you will see some examples of people uh, who also are good, um, remarkable in the way they display themselves and conducted when they met people of different nationality and some of them were also Asians. So God used his servants. Uh, we're going to see the first one is Peter. Peter was a fisherman, but we, he encountered some challenges. He was involved in the ministry of healing to a Greek woman, Tabitha, and later through a message from the Lord, he went to the home of Cornelius, a Roman centurion. And here he preached the word of God powerfully, resulting in mass conversion. Then we want to see the next slide about um, the Ethiopian eunuch. Sorry, it's in the, the next slide on Ethiopian eunuch. If you can move to the next slide. Yes, the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip who also came to him. And we are told in church history that the eunuch went back to his home in Ethiopia and he shared the good news with that whole country. Now we're going to look at the Apostle Paul, if you could reverse back to Paul. As we know, the Paul was an ordinary person just like any one of us, but he became extraordinary. And from the time of conversion, he had many opportunities in preaching, teaching, healing, and finally making three missionary journeys. He was a true cross-culture missionary. Paul and Barnabas made an impact that resulted in both Jews and Greeks becoming believers in Iconium. And then in Acts 16, we read the example of Lydia, who became a believer as a result of Paul's ministry. And as a businesswoman, she was very influential in her, se in her setting. Then finally, we read in Acts 17, in the next slide, we read about the Church of Corinth, and we are reminded how this was a city of Greece, where Paul labored and which was visited by Apollos. They experienced the presence of diverse groups of people. Here the residents were Asians, Jews, and Greeks. So the apostles were challenged to proclaim and teach individuals in, a particular, in this particular pluralistic society. And then finally, we also want to look at others in the New Testament in the next slide. Uh, Priscilla and Aquila worked together with Paul and they were instrumental in some of the teachings, preachings, and ministering of people um, with different contexts. 
then uh, in the next slide, we see the implications in today's mission leaders in globalization. I think one of the remarkable things that we can take note of uh, the way Peter had a heart and emphasis on doing good and keeping a clear conscience in the face of persecution. Today, God can use each one of us to reach out to those in the pluralistic society. We can make an impact through our lifestyle and witness to individuals in our respective situations. Are there also individuals waiting for us uh, to share the good news? Just before I came to uh, the conference, I was uh, t training some uh, leaders from Asia, Africa, and Latin America in this subject, pluralistic. And many of them struggle, they said, reaching out to those uh, in Hinduism, Buddhism, and Islam. But I praise God that uh, they are ready to share the good news and they can be salt and light in this world. So in Acts 17, in page 25, I've mentioned that as we look at Acts 17, we see the process and the steps that God used the Apostle Paul. For example, he went to the synagogue and there he was going from the known to the unknown and he used this approach. And he realized that this is one way that he could bring the truth and finally present Christ. And then in verse 19, again in Acts 17, Paul stood on a hill and he spoke about the one true God. Just imagine all those idols around him, but yet he continued to preach the one true living God. And in verse 22, Paul came prepared with his training and knowledge and he presented the scriptural beliefs clearly and persuasively. And I believe that's true because in all my experiences ministering to people of other religious groups, sometimes I have to use the persuasive method and that get them to think and reflect and come to a decision. And this was the result of much thinking and reasoning. And now was the opportunity to participate by answering questions and arguments effectively. And then in verse 22 onwards, Paul approached in communicating the gospel by using familiar examples, exploring common grounds on the doctrines of God, creation, and then to challenge people to us making a decision on the risen Christ. The message is the same, but the method will vary according to the listeners who are present. So there will be individuals who will respond. I'm sure many of us have experienced it in Asia, meeting individuals, and it's an encouragement in our ministry of missions in a pluralistic society. So what choices are we making living in a pluralistic society? I'd like to suggest strategies. If you go on to the next slide, I mentioned some strategies. I believe some of you have seen this slide. It's very unusual to see a newborn baby praying, but it's possible to start them praying from a very young age. And um, so as we think about the strategy, I'd like to recommend um, a mission model uh, you have this mission model in your handout on page 26. And if somebody was doing the slides, could just forward it of a few more down, a little bit more, the next one, and the next one, two, a few more down, keep going. Yes, this one. In this one, what I did is put on the left side the doctrines. I call it doctrine of creation. Then the second doctrine is doctrine of fall. The third one is redemption. And on the right, I said the mission leader. How can we as a mission leader be effective in a pluralistic society? So as we think about the doctrine of creation, and I've explained that on page 27, many of the people that we are ministering in pluralistic contexts often use creation stories. So we can also teach using the creation story about God and ourselves that God's Son, Jesus, Holy Spirit, was at work in creation. So therefore, created objects and images will not satisfy our longing for the worship of the true creator. And I believe we know that we need to be tactful. And as we talk about their idols, it's good for them also to express why they believe in idols. When we talk about the doctrine of the fall, Adam and Eve chose disobedience. Once I heard a little boy, a Sunday school student, who had just come to Sunday school, he's from China, and he says, teacher, he raised up his hand 
The first lesson that day was on Genesis. He said, teacher, if Adam and Eve were Chinese, we would have no sin in this world. So of course the teacher is bright and uh, powerful and uh, she knows the scriptures. So she said, how is that possible? And he said, this teenage boy, he says, we Chinese like to eat meat. So we would have eaten the serpent, not the forbidden fruit. <laughs> so the teacher said, wow, there's new theology. I've never heard that Chinese will eat the serpent if they were Adam and Eve. The teacher is pretty bright. She said, oh, I know all the Chinese love to eat dessert after the meal. So they will still eat the forbidden fruit. <laughs> so she went on to explain. And finally, together with his family members, they paid, prayed to receive Christ. Today, my church in Singapore, we are doing missions in, on Sunday evenings, reaching out to all the foreign workers from China and from Bangladesh. And we have seen more than a thousand coming to know the Lord. And after the second year of their contract, they return home, but they continue to share the good news of Jesus Christ with their family and loved ones. My church, Fairfield Methodist Church, is a mission a church and a praying church. We have sent missionaries to Asia, Africa, and South America. I believe all our churches in Asia can do that, that we continue to go to other parts of the world. So as we talk about the fall, the pre-believers learn of the broken relationship with God, and this concept will help us in times of prejudice and hatred towards those of other race and religion. And so we have seen that the prejudice and how when they come to know that we are brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, I believe this prejudice will slowly be erased. The third uh, doctrine I'd like to suggest is the doctrine of redemption. This gives the pre-believer living in a pluralistic society a picture of the love of God, the message of good news, that he sent his only son into the world to die for our sins. God's gift to the world was an act of compassion through the death of his son, Jesus Christ, who rose from the dead, will come again to receive all those who had believed on his name. By believing and confessing the name of Christ, we become his children. We are then reconciled with God as co-workers in Christ. God has provided a way for all people to come to him regardless of our race and religion. God's forgiveness is for the world. So when I was growing up in a Hindu family, I remember nobody told me about Jesus or said that, you know, God forgives us. It was not till a school teacher gave me a Bible. And when I was invited to church in Sunday school, I heard for the first time that God sent his one and only son to die on the cross that my sins would be forgiven. So that day when I made that confession and received Christ into my life, I was very happy. And the leaders told me, uh, you've got to go home and share with your family and that they too will come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. So of course, when I reached home, there was persecution, there was so much of a upset. So I called the church members, leaders. I said, you all got me into trouble. Now you can come and rescue me as well. Talk to my parents. So they did. And so I was glad that was the beginning of how we were all reconciled to the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe another strategy is interfaith dialogue which I've mentioned on page 27. We can see that in the next slide, uh, faith dialogue, meaning that uh, we can interact with Hindus. And in the next slide, we realize that human relationship is very important. There's also dialogue needed with Muslims. And in the next, few, next two slides, you will see the importance of interfaith dialogue with the Buddhists. If you can turn on to the next slide, yes. The late Dr. John Starr reinforces the view that the humble way of communicating is the way of dialogue. And I believe that in the time available, we can seek the truth together leading to openness. By engaging the mind of a Hindu, a Muslim, or a Buddhist, the believer is seeking the word of God with, to each of them with relevance. So we are able to learn of their beliefs and the various critical responses to the Christian faith. In such time, I will share my conversion experience and weave in the gospel. And one of the ways I've done is prepare my testimony and put it in a one minute, either in a, a conversation, and that way if somebody says to me, tell me your testimony in one minute, I'll have it ready and I'll put it in my Bible. Because many years ago, um, I loaned my Bible to a friend who went on a retreat, and she forgot to bring my Bible back. 
But after a month, somebody called me and said to me, oh, I've got your Bible because I saw it's, your name is there and your phone number is there. She says that that morning, she was walking along the beach and she was, going, she was contemplating suicide. She was walking towards the water, getting into the ocean, but suddenly her eyes moved, shifted, and she saw this Bible on the rock. So she went backwards and went and got the Bible and started to read the Gospels. And that morning, as she sat on the rocks on that lonely beach, she prayed to receive Christ. So praise God for the Word of God that we should uh, give it to someone as a gift and look for ways that individuals will come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Yesterday in the group sessions, I heard many of us uh, mentioning about ministry dialogue with Hindus, Buddhists, and Muslims, and I believe we are doing that today. And I found that very meaningful whenever I interview a Muslim convert. One of the things they have said is that they receive the Bible as a gift, that Jesus is more than a prophet. Many of my classmates and friends were former Hindus, so when I went to share my testimony and talk to them and listen to them and have a roundtable conference, they began to reply that they were waiting to hear the true and one and living God because there were thousands of gods in Hinduism. And finally, whenever I meet a Buddhist and those that lived in Singapore were well, many of my classmates, they said, could you conduct a Bible study? And so I chose the Gospel of John even though it's full of symbols, but they were willing to study the Gospel of John. And I was glad that uh, that group uh, were willing to open uh, for discussion. And finally, they told their parents, we want to follow Jesus, who's the way, the truth, and the life. In conclusion, let's look at page 30. We see that God has a significant task for the church in this global picture. There's an urgent call for leaders, missionaries, and the laity to continue the Great Commission. We need to pass the baton to the next generation through the training of leaders on the biblical mandate. How will we train our Asian leaders towards godliness with a sense of God's divine plan for their lives? Most of our Asian cities are like the church in Corinth today. We learn in Acts 17 that Paul proclaimed Christ. How can we be single-minded in a pluralistic society. Dear brothers and sisters, attending Asia Missions Association and the churches that you re represent and the organizations that you represent, let's encourage and remind each other through networking and prayer that the heart of the gospel is essential for missions in the next slide, in a pluralistic society. I believe this is the greatest challenge for the 21st century that we bring the gospel, the good news, and we also bring our testimony, our lives. Jesus called us to be salt and light in this world. To God be the glory. I want to close with Paul's prayer in Romans chapter 10, verse 1. He says, my prayer, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them, I would like to say for those in pluralistic society, is that they may be saved. So may God encourage you and we want to put you to work today. I believe many of you are seated around the table. If you look at page uh, 30, I have listed some questions. We'd like to encourage those of you sitting on my right here in the round table, if you can get together in a round table, as many of you, to look at question one. What are some creative ways to present the gospel to friends of different faith? and to a group of religious leaders if we meet them from different backgrounds. What else, what else can we do to present it? So we like to encourage you to do that. And those of you on my left, where this middle aisle is the dividing line, I'd like you to look at the second question. What is the position of the Christian community with the pluralists on the task of evangelizing through home visitation and Bible study discussion? If you meet a pluralist and they're willing to come to your home for home visits and Bible study, what would be your responsibility? So we're giving you five minutes. So use that five minutes to talk to one another. And then Dr. Petra will bring us back together. <laughs>